Well, the first band that I was in was a band called Active Ingredients. Uh, it was a punk rock band. Got started in 82, 83. It was a four-piece band. It was myself, a guy named Brian Moore. I played bass. Kenny Hillman played guitar. Uh, Don Wooten was a drummer, and uh, I was the singer. So guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. And uh, we did all original material. It was the first, my first uh, foray into, uh, into making music. And so I was, I didn't really know what I was doing. I don't, really nobody did. And that was what was great about the, the whole punk rock ideology. And that was, everything was DIY at the time and we did it ourselves. It's kind of that way now. And flyers were huge at the time, you know, peppering everywhere with uh, flyers for upcoming shows. There was no social media, there was no internet, there was no Photoshop. But I remember spending like two days working on a flyer and then spending another day going out and putting flyers up. So you'd spend two or three days just on promotion stuff, you know. But it was kind of fun because making flyers was, you know, it was, um, it was making art. Now, you know, before uh, the, the, the punk rock movement, uh, there really wasn't much original music going on. It just kind of wasn't, uh, it just wasn't happening. I mean, most of the bands that, um, uh, that were playing in Lexington were cover bands. Um, and then you had some bands that were uh, doing like 70s, like early, late 60s and 70s blues influenced rock and roll and stuff. Um, but not too many like garage bands. Um, so once the punk rock movement came, came along, it kind of, it jump started everything. <laughs> And then I remember I, the first time I heard uh, "Never Mind the Bullocks," "Sex Pistols." That kind of opened, that kind of changed things for me. I was like, "Wow, this is crazy." I was living out in the suburbs at the time, so right around the end of the '70s, and '80s, I moved to downtown Lexington, and that's where the punk rock, the Lexington punk rock scene, was just starting to starting to bloom a little bit. God save the queen. Before I was doing anything musically, there was a club called Club A Go Go, which was over on Winchester Road, and uh, that was that was a really cool club. A, a guy named Bradley Picklesheimer uh, was the was the guy that opened that that venue. But a lot of great bands played there, and that kind of got me. That's kind of what got that kind of kicked it in for me. Some of the first shows we did, there was a place called uh, called BC's, and it's where the old Tally Ho was on um, on Limestone there. Prowl Town Cafe, which was on Prowl Street, which is over on uh, near U uh, University of Kentucky campus. LMNOP, which was on Main Street, and that was a short-lived uh, club. Uh, it was probably there for a year or two. And then after Active Ingredients broke up, oh, uh, and this was probably 86, um, I started a band called the Resurrected Bloated Floaters, which was um, a little different uh, than the Active Ingredients. It was a little bit more um, country influenced, uh, but it was kind of, um, it was still rooted in punk rock and rock and roll. And that was a short-lived band too. I think we were only together for two years. 
we did a, a full length LP, and then we recorded another full length that never saw the light of day. The master tapes were lost, which was a bummer. We spent a lot of time recording, you know, a full length record, and the tapes were lost. So, and then we broke up shortly thereafter. So it's like, so that was that. After uh, you know, the resurrected bloated floaters broke up, I was in a band called Born Joey, maybe a year or so. And after that band broke up, I started another band uh, with Brian Polito, a band called Rabby Fever. And that band was a little different than uh, previous bands that I'd been in. We recorded a lot of samples of our own music and put together these uh, sequences uh, from samples that we'd recorded and, put, and made songs. And we made dat recordings of the sequences and pumped that through the main uh, through the PA and the monitors and then played on top of that. So you had uh, uh, digital samples of our own stuff that we played on top of. So you had uh, digital drums, digital guitars, some vocal samples going on and then we played live on top of that. So it was a pretty big sound. And then after that, uh, my first kind of laid low for a couple years and then I start, in 2003 I started a band called the Yellow Belts which to this day we're still together now. Um, it's just a punk rock, rock and roll band. The primary venue at that time in Lexington was a venue called um, uh, the Rockledge. which uh, was around for quite a few years, actually. Or it seemed like it was around for a few years. Throughout the 80s and the 90s was uh, Linus, the old Linus, and they did a lot of, uh, a lot of shows there. The Dame on, um, on Main Street was one of the best venues. Would actually make some money so we could actually record, you know? WRFL was definitely um, a, a nice shot in the arm for uh, legs in the music scene. Uh, Mark Beatty and Kaki Urk, those, those two folks were kind of um, very instrumental in um, getting um, WRFL off the ground. At the time, I remember when they were trying to, uh, trying to make a uh, college radio station happen, everybody was saying, you know, a lot of people were saying, there's just no way, if, you know, the uh, administration at UK, that's just not going to happen, it's too conservative. But those guys were very tenacious and then uh, they made it happen. And once WRFL went on online, things that definitely changed things up pretty dramatically. Local music was being broadcast over the airwaves and that's something, that, that, that was like, wow! I remember the first time I heard some of my own music on the airwaves, I was like, it was kind of surreal. Uh, it's like I never, never thought that would happen. And WRFL, you know, I think from day one, they, I don't think they've ever gone offline. I think they've been on 24-7, 365 days a year since they went on the air, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty, ambitious, pretty cool that they've been able to pull that off. Finding um, photographs and relics from then are a little bit not as ubiquitous as they are today. I mean, today everybody's, everybody's got a camera on their phone. So photographs from that time period are kind of rare. So it's kind of cool that 
that you're archiving, trying to archive these, you know, uh, that time period, because eventually all that stuff, if it's not documented, it'll probably just turn into dust. I'm just fascinated by, you know, relics from the past, being able to, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is, there's something mystical about it, but it's, it's, it's cool that, that there are people out there that are documenting um, the past. <laughs> Archivist, you know, that's really cool. Right now in Lexington, I think the, the music scene is pretty healthy. Lots of good bands. Once again, being in a, a town like uh, uh, Lexington, where you have a big university, there's always a lot of young people that are interested in music and interested in making music, so it makes for a healthy uh, uh, music environment. It was, I'm glad I've had a chance to do it, uh, to, to, to um, be part of the music scene in Lexington. It was pretty exciting to be able to actually uh, start a band without being a musician.